Welcome to the Wealth Matters Podcast, where investors come together to better understand how to build passive cash flow and create generational wealth without all the confusing mumbo jumbo. Here's your host and co author of Amazon number one bestseller, Alpesh Pamar. Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. Today's guest is John Ostenson. John is a top 1% franchise consultant nationally, and he leads Fran Briz Consulting as CEO. John draws on his experience as a former Inc. 500 franchise president and multi-brand franchisee in serving his clients. So welcome, John. Alpesh, thanks for having me. Love the show and uh, excited to be here. Absolutely. Thank you. So, uh, John, of course, you know, we have spoken with a couple of guests, as I mentioned before, Kim Daly and Scott Miles regarding franchising. Uh, of course, when I looked at your bio, you come from franchising world. So it, it sounded interesting and in how we can connect the dots or how we can uh, see why you, uh, we can see that real estate investors are getting into franchising as well. So that was one of the topic I was really interested in because uh, most of my listeners are real estate investors. I'm personally as well, a big time real estate investor. So this would be a pretty interesting episode. But before we get started, I ask this question to every guest. Tell us something interesting or funny about yourself? <laughs> it's interesting or funny about myself. You know, I'd say um, live here in Atlanta, Georgia with my wife and three young kids. And uh, But something interesting about myself, I, I took my team skydiving a couple of years ago. I was leading a larger company at the time and we had about 40 employees and we, you know, no one had ever gone skydiving before, including myself. And, you know, we, we, <laughs> a little airplane was going up in the sky and, you know, was feeling okay about it. But then the door opened and uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it got real fast. But, you know, I, I teed myself up to embrace the pressure and it did make the jump. But, um, yeah, that, that was an eye opening experience. And everyone on our team ended up jumping, which was neat. A lot of people, uh, overcame, a lot of people so, overcame fear that day. So, uh, was that part of team building? You can call okay. it that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it can't be team building, right? And I'm pretty sure some of them did not jump, but they were pushed. <laughs> just, uh, so, some may have called it hazing, but we call it team building. <laughs> <laughs> so no, that that was funny. Well, let's and we talk about investment here all the time, right? And that's how we start building wealth or start generating supplemental or passive income. So, what was your first investment? And how did it work out for you? Yeah, first investment. Fortunately, I've made a lot of really good investments since that first one. But the first one uh, went south. It was back in 06. I uh, bought several pieces of raw land. Um, um, so that was my first foray outside of you know my primary home. I, I was a young guy at the time. And uh, with a partner, bought several pieces of raw land pre-development. Uh, you know, we didn't think real estate could ever go down and we quickly learned that lesson, but was fortunate to have a solvent partner as well. And the two of us continued to make payments on it for many years and eventually sold it for um, a fraction of what it was originally purchased for. And oh, wow. And took, took the tax treatment benefits from that to offset <laughs> right. gains that we'd had from better investments. <laughs> so uh, just like the dot-com bubble was my first foray into stock investing, you know, you learn and uh, you build off of that. So Yeah. And you always have to look at the bright side, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Fortunately, like I said, I've had many good investments since then in franchising, but also in real estate. I, I'm a pretty active investor as well. Oh, that's awesome. So how did you get started with Fran Bridge Consulting? What happened? Because uh, you just mentioned you are former Inc. 500 uh, franchising uh, and you're the one of the president as well. So what happened and why did you switch to consulting? Yeah. You know, like so many of your listeners had a long career in the corporate world, had a good run, but I uh, wanted to get with a private company, had been with a public company and <clears throat> stepped in as uh, president of Shelf Genie Franchise System. So Shelf Genie, uh, custom Inc. 500 franchisor, custom plot shelving for kitchens and pantries. And for me, that was the pivotal moment. I, I came in, had the opportunity to support franchisees day in, day out, and just open up my eyes to this world of franchising that I've now dubbed non-food franchising. So it's all these other industries that, that people are getting involved in. At Shelf Genie, I ended up partnering with the founder. We eventually spun off. We've invested in franchises ourselves. So I'm invested in about six different franchises myself as a franchisee now. So I've sat on both sides of the table. Yeah, but I, I've got good people running those for me and allows me to spend most of my time 
helping others do the same. And so at Frambridge, we work with over 600 different franchise companies, you know, part of the largest brokerage in North America. And um, yeah, we, we get to do more placements, I believe, than just about anybody else out there. So um, yeah, love helping people. Oh, that's awesome. And you mentioned non-food. So, of course, you know, as I mentioned before we started recording, I personally looked into franchising as well. Uh, just somehow it did not work out for me. Uh, means I didn't go ahead. But I see that franchising is hot right now, especially non-food, as you mentioned. Who is buying? Why are they buying? And what are they buying? Yeah, great questions. I you know, who is buying? It is a wide range. And so we've got everyone from their 20s to 60s. I'd say quite a few people in their 40s and 50s, you know, buying in. Um, you know, about one third of our clients are looking to make the full time jump and step in as owner operator and run the day to day operations. But about two thirds of our clients are looking to put a manager in place and manage the manager. And so they're looking to, you know, essentially create another revenue stream within their portfolio, let's say, or, or keep the day job. Um, what they're buying, you know, it's, it's what I like to call boring businesses. It's things that are more needs based, less discretionary, understandable, cash flowing, Amazon resistant businesses. So, examples of that would be like home and property services, where maybe it's, you know, gutters or insulation or dumpsters or floor coatings. You know, it, maybe it's uh, senior care. You know, people will always spend on certain categories regardless of the economy. And I think we've all been talking about a recession for about a decade now. What if the economy does turn a little bit south? What kind of business do you want to own? And what I go back to is, hey, what are you personally going to continue to spend on regardless of the economy? You want to spend on your kids, on your pets, on your aging parents, on your homes, on your health. And so businesses that fill all these different niches within these sectors I, are where we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of attention right now. We're still doing a little bit of fitness, a little bit of automotive, but I'd say these other industries are really getting most of the attention. And any any franchises in particular or any service, industry service specific criteria? Let's say when you say child, maybe is it daycare or or when you mention our seniors, is it yeah. senior housing or, or home-based senior care? Yeah, I'll give you some examples from recent deals of ours. We've had five different clients around the country buy into a soccer franchise uh, for kids soccer. Um, mm. that, that'd be an example in the kids space. We've an example in senior space. We've had five or six clients now buy into in-home health care where it's, you know, companion care and, and such. Um, the, the franchisor behind this one had built a business of 700 locations in the senior care industry, came to the conclusion that there's a better mousetrap to be had better model. And so he rolled that out. And so it's an emerging brand, but he brings a ton of experience and they're just getting a ton of traction right now. They've got a better way of going about recruiting caregivers and managing mm -hmm. that whole relationship, um, which is obviously a huge need in the market. Um, but I, I just got the phone with the franchisor a few minutes ago for a, a franchise around men's testosterone and men's health, which is you know top of mind for a lot of us these right. days. <laughs> and so all these different niches. I mean, we did nine deals for a great gutter company last year, nine separate clients. We had everyone wow. from a Wall Street attorney in Boston to a doctor in Portland. We had insurance guys, we had corporate guys that bought into a business and what is a highly fragmented market where they saw the opportunity to step in and uh, you know, with a variable cost approach, really scale a business with great profit margins. No, oh, that is very interesting. And I think it makes sense because uh, I personally invest... Uh, you know, as a real estate investor, we buy mobile home parks, but we also invest in senior uh, housing facilities, right? So I do see the trend. And of course, kids, yeah, you can't go wrong <laughs> with that. So you mentioned that real estate investors are also investing in franchising. Why are real estate investors a great fit for franchising? Yeah, nearly every one of our clients also invest in real estate. And, you know, I think there's a lot of similarities. One, you know, it's that mindset of creating additional revenue streams. It's it's an interest in the tax benefits of these investments, you know, that are more active versus, or you know, they can be semi-passive, but they're not just investing in the stock market. You know, you're able to take deductions, you know, from a tax standpoint in these. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, they can be complimentary. A lot of our real estate investors say, hey, I'd love to get into a property services 
business that I can, I can use on my own properties, but also, you know, use for others because I'm pretty well networked. And so it just kind of creates more of a vertical integration within their portfolio versus having to outsource all these different services. In some cases, they like the diversification play that it provides. They say, hey, we're heavy in multifamily. We've got a few single families and duplexes, but we really like the idea of also creating, you know, an active business where there's maybe, you know, maybe they're not a real estate professional and they can't take certain depreciation expenses. But now over here, they can write off certain expenses or pay their kids to work in the business and, you know, give them earned income that they can put into a Roth IRA now and they take the deduction. So, you know, there's just a unique place I think real estate investors naturally get. Um, in some cases, you know, we have direct relationships where like, we had a broker, a real estate broker recently that bought a property management franchise. That was a great bolt on. Yeah. He said, I don't want to start from scratch. I'd rather get an existing playbook and proven system. Uh, we have some that say, hey, you know, we own this um, multifamily building with a retail, you know, a couple of open retail spaces at the bottom. We'd love to fill those with franchises. Um, so there's a few different angles, but yeah, nearly every one of our clients also invest in real estate. So that was interesting uh, when you mentioned about the depreciation benefits from real estate, because a lot of us invest in real estate. Of course, the first thing is um, uh, cash flow, right? You want some kind of cash flow. And then the second is, you know, you look at appreciation that, okay, in five, 10 years, but the third most important thing is depreciation or the, or the phantom pay loss on paper, right? Which is which helps you write off passive income stream if you are not a real estate professional, right? right? So, so in this case, though, if I'm uh, investing in real estate, that's my passive loss the, coming from depreciation. And if I'm running franchising, that would be my active income, right? So the, the active income cannot be written off against uh, the real depreciation loss from real estate, right? Right. But my point being, it just gives you more diversification from a tax player. I mean, there are things okay. you you may not be paying your kids over there. You may not be able to expense yeah. certain items that you can now, you know, through a yes. business. So as you just think about the holistic tax approach, um, I mean, that's something that I personally do. I write off depreciation on the real estate side, but you know, there are a lot of things I'm able to write off, um, at, you know, on the active income side. And really it's, it's what I call the trifecta. <laughs> As you mentioned, it's cash flow, it's appreciation, but then there's also those tan uh, tangible tax benefits. Yeah, no, I agree. And those that, that trifecta or three-legged stool is very important, right? So how do you compare then real estate to a franchisee? Yeah, I think there's a, certainly a place for, um, a, for, for each within the portfolio. And I had multiple clients just this morning uh, say, hey, you know, that, that we got had our intro calls they said, hey, you know, we're invested in real estate. We're going to continue investing in real estate, but we've been looking and we can't find a lot of good deals right now. Now, I'd say yes, they should talk to true. you because <laughs> you're able to find deals that other people are not. But, you know, and that's indicative of calls I'm having every day where, hey, stock markets all over the place, interest rates, you know, where do we get yield right now? We love real estate, but where else should we be playing outside of crypto or some of those other tertiary markets? And a lot of them are arriving at, hey, business ownership. And we just have case study after case study of clients that own both real estate and multiple active businesses. And the great thing about franchising versus starting a business from scratch is beyond the playbook and all the other benefits is that you've got a franchisor that can man help manage that franchisee, that, the, the manager. And so it's a manage the manager approach where you don't have to be involved in the day-to-day. -day. Now, it does take putting a good manager in place. But they can go to the franchise or with their technical questions. The burden doesn't fully fall on you from a day-to-day -day basis. They can be semi-absentee. And that is very important because as a real estate investor, it's all about building team, right? We, I just don't go. I, as I told you earlier, I buy in markets like Atlanta, Birmingham, all the way to North Carolina, mm -hmm. South Carolina. I don't go there. I have partners. I have built a team there, you know, from property manager to contractors to operating partners, and they do all the work pretty much, right? My, uh, so, and that is the model. Uh, if I get into it or any other real estate investor, they would want to replicate in franchising world as well, that you don't want to, um, you know, get into another job, right? That's the, that's the key, right? You don't, you don't, right. you don't want to work 
in the business. <laughs> yeah, at least not forever. We do have a right. lot of people that say, hey, for six months, we're going to grind and get it, you know, stand up the business. And then we're going to pass it on to someone and let them run it. And we move on to the next thing. And again, we just have case study after case study of clients that have done that and built out a portfolio. No, that makes sense. So let's talk about uh, franchising versus, you know, starting something from scratch, right? What are the pros and cons? If yeah. I'm, you know, going with a franchisee or or, or starting a, a company from scratch. Yeah. On the con side, you know, you do have to stay within the lines. You know, you can't put your thumbprints all over the business. You know, there, right. there, there are some rules in place. Um, another con would be, you know, you are paying a royalty fee back to the franchisor, so it can impact your margin. However, hopefully there are offsets that more than offset right. that, yes. which you want to figure out in the expiration process. And you, you want to be asking those questions, what kind of value am I getting for this royalty? Yeah, but on the positive side, which I think greatly outweighs the cons would be, you know, you're getting a proven playbook. You know, this has been shown in other markets to work. You know the path to profitability from day one, and you just go out there and execute it. Um, you know, you've got a coach on the sidelines, that franchise or the better you do, the better they do. So they should be aligned with you, at least the good ones. They're not all created, equal, right. but the good ones. <laughs> um, and that's where we help our clients. Um, you've got other franchisees in the system. They're living the same thing in their markets day in and day out. And so you're constantly exchanging best practices and learning so that you don't repeat the same mistakes, let's say. Um, you know, one thing, you know, you've got bulk buying power, whether it be product or whether it be services. Uh, oftentimes you have larger marketing data from which to operate because you have in, the franchisor has insight into all these different markets. And so you're able to optimize your ad spend earlier. Um, you know, and then also from an exit standpoint, when you go to sell the business down the road, there have been s- multiple studies that have shown that you trade at a higher multiple, typically if you're a franchise versus a non-franchise in a like kind of industry. And there's one study that looked at 2,000 transactions over a 10-year period in like-kind industries and proved out that franchises traded at a multiple one and a half times non-franchises. Wow. Again, comparing apples to apples. So there's value from the exit standpoint as well. Oh, that makes sense. So now let's talk about the other side. What about buying? And that is where I got stuck when I was trying to do uh, look into franchising that what about buying an as the existing business versus starting a franchise. Yeah. You know, there's certainly some great existing businesses out there to buy. Um, I do think oftentimes they are a needle in the haystack. You know, if it's a really great business, right. a lot of times someone's <laughs> holding on to it. Uh, so that can be a challenge is finding it. And you have a lot of other people looking as well. That whole idea of entrepreneurship through acquisition you know, is, is a very popular idea. You know, and on paper, it sounds great in theory. Hey, we've got a business, it's cash flowing. It's got a team in place. It's got market visibility and awareness already. Flip side is you never know what happens when a transaction takes place. You step in, maybe the representations the seller made weren't quite accurate. Maybe your best people leave, which can happen oftentimes when, yes. you, have, when you have a change yes. in management. You know, maybe uh, a key client leaves, it, just depending on the industry and how weighted it is by different clients. Um, so there's different risk to it. And if it's not a franchise, you don't have that franchise or to lean on. You're in business now for yourself, but you're also by yourself. And so, you know, again, we certainly work with some resales, but I will say they're few and far between as far as the really high quality ones. And that's why we oftentimes like these these great models and you bring it to the market, maybe it takes a little more work out of the gate, but you're not paying a premium for it. And you also have a lot more runway and, and less risk. That's uh, no, I think that makes sense. And that's where I was stuck that I'm like, I want to buy something which starts generating cash flow from day one. Yeah. I don't want to rely on, you know, six months after the fact and then focus on finding a real estate even just in the franchising world in San Francisco Bay Area is a pain. <laughs> for sure now you got to look outside yeah <laughs> so let's talk about the financials the financials of franchising cost revenue profit potential yeah you know certainly if we're doing laundromats or you know some oil changes i mean you can have some high ticket investments but a lot of the service type businesses that our clients are getting involved in when you look at the franchise fee the startup cost and then also build in several months of working capital all in oftentimes you're looking at 
you know, somewhere between 150 and 350. I'd say that's where a lot of uh, opportunities are falling. Now, if you have a huge retail build out, that can certainly take the price tag north. But a lot, most of ours are in that 200, 250 ish range. Some of our clients are using cash. Some are using SBA loans to fund it. That's very common. Some are using an old retirement plan and rolling that over. Some will use the HELOC. Rob's, right? It's called Rob's. Rob's you got Rob's, it. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, because I looked into it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So Rob's can be a great option. HELOC, uh, obviously, or uh, a line of credit, maybe a portfolio loan. Uh, so a lot of different ways to fund it. And, you know, the, the returns are certainly across the board. I'd say, you know, I'll just give one example here, that, that gutter business where we did nine deals last year. <laughs> and, and these numbers are stronger than average. That's why we did nine deals with this one, but it gives an example of you know what is possible. All an investment on that one, you're right around 200,000. Well, their average franchisee is doing 1.7 million in revenue. Wow. Many have hit 1 million in the first year and then 1.7 maybe in year two or three or four. And so, you know, scales up at 1.7 average across their system and they're netting 28% to the bottom line. So call that, you know, close to 500,000 to the bottom line. Even if you're paying a manager, call it 100, I don't know, 125,000, you're paying well, you're still profiting 375 on an investment of 200,000 and you get the tax write-offs and you have an exit down the road. And so, you know, I, obviously that's that, you know, the gutters, I mean, that's a $6 billion market space, yes. highly fragmented. You go in there, you've got the marketing, you've got the call center with the franchise or you've got the technology, you got the supply chain of product. It's just a better, a better approach. Um, now within that, you know, that's one example. I'd say a lot of our clients, you know, margins are oftentimes in that 20% range, you know, that's 20% of revenue, but you extrapolate that net and, and, and compare it to what you initially got in the investment for Yes, You can generate some really eye opening returns. Um, you know, we always tell, tell our clients, let's go conservative the nice thing with franchising is you've got what's called the item 19 within that FDD or franchise disclosure documents. You know how other franchisees in their system are doing. But I always tell my clients, even though we'll probably outperform the average, just based on the yeah. caliber of people we work with, let's assume that you have a slower ramp up. Let's assume that you only do two thirds of the average. Is there still enough meat on the bone to make this an attractive investment? And in most cases, our clients would say yes. Oh, that's awesome. So is there anything else we need to talk about or I forgot? No, I think, you know, what I found is people just get excited when they start hearing about the types of opportunities out there. You know, I'd say over 90% of our clients end up purchasing something they never had on their radar. And so oftentimes you don't know what you're looking for until it's right in front of you. And that's kind of where the magic happens. So uh, we love being able, being able to help people. It's entirely free to work with us. Um, you know, we're funded by the franchise company. It's very much like a real estate model, if you will. Um, so more than happy to jump on the phone and, and chat with anyone that has an interest. Would also, uh, you know, love to offer our book, Non-Food Franchising, to any of your listeners. You know, if they come out to our website, frambridgeconsulting.com, uh, we'll make sure to get them a couple of digital copies of that audio and, and PDF as well. Um, That's yeah, awesome. Love to share that. Thank you. So I think we pretty much finished most of the things we wanted to discuss. Are you ready for fire round? Yeah, let's do it. Would you be changing any business or investment strategy because of the current environment? You know, we know the inflation is still out of control, uh, even though it's heading down, seems like that. And uh, recession seems to be around the corner. You know, I listen to all the talking heads online and they, they continue to be wrong. Wall Street Journal put an article out just yesterday about, you know, the fact that we may not even enter a recession. Others right. say that we are in a recession. All I know is what I see on the ground right now is positive economic activity. We just did a deal in San Francisco two weeks ago. We're doing them in Southern California and New York and Seattle and Chicago, places that get no positive news headlines nationally. Right. There's still activity on the ground. Oh, yes. So, Yes. I'm encouraged by what I see. I think it bodes well for the future of our country. And, and I love the entrepreneurship that's going on. Oh, that's great. Favorite nonfiction book other than yours or mine? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Other than ours. Uh, I'd say The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. Yes. I recommended that one many times. It's just the idea of those small yes. decisions over time and the compounding effect. Uh, that's a great but, book. Any tool or website you recommend or you cannot live without? Can't live without Calendly. 
<laughs> the greatest integration of my business a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a game changer from a communication standpoint, be able to align uh, and streamline kind of the calendaring, which is everything. Thank you. Any advice for investors? Say for investors, the older I get, the more I invest in people. I invest in concepts I like, but there's got to be, it starts at the top, the, the franchisor CEO or the head of the real estate syndication. In the past week, I've made investments actually in both of those categories, but it comes down to that person running it. I've got to have trust in them. They've got to have a track record. And that just carries so much more weight than anything else about the investment. How do you give back? How do I give back? Well, all the proceeds from my book go to a great organization, Hope International, which is helping entrepreneurs throughout the world. My son and I got to go on a mission trip last year with Hope International down to the Dominican and see firsthand the great work that they're doing. So uh, whether it be through our church or whether it be um, through great organizations like Hope International, uh, definitely I, I'm a big believer in stewardship and uh, the importance of giving back. Perfect. How can my listeners reach out to you? Yeah, again, come out to franbridgeconsulting.com. That's F-R-A-N bridgeconsulting.com. Sign up for our free newsletter. I would love to send you a copy of our book. And like I said, you know, if there's interest in taking a next step and jumping on a call, we'd be more than happy to help. Thank you so much, John, for your time today. Enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the Wealth Matters podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes so others can enjoy the show too. Have a great week and happy investing!